Hi, so I want to introduce a few of the cases that we're going to mention uh, as background for the main cases. Um, so a brief set summary of Kelly versus Arebasoft. Um, and the slide shows you the search engine at issue in the case. Um, then uh, here are some additional uh, Google search results uh, using images from Kelly, the plaintiff. Uh, this case was discussed in Perfect 10 as a prior significant holding. Um, as to the thumbnails hosted by the search engine's own servers, the purpose was transformative. The work was not transformed, but its use, cataloging, uh, images of different things instead of depicting a particular scene was changed. There's clearly a social benefit, but why isn't the photographer entitled to compensation for contributing to that social benefit of having uh, visual search engines? The basic answer is the impossibility of licensing everyone. The system of wide access only works if there's participation by default and holdouts are too dangerous to the overall functioning of the system. This need for wide participation uh, to make the database valuable distinguishes the big data cases from the cases in which a particular work is targeted for copying. The nature of the work, creative and the amount taken, all of it, favored the plaintiff. However, the, there was no uh, uh, market effect weighing against fair use because of the lower resolution of the thumbnails. So you can see uh, how factors one and four are key in Kelly as in many cases. Once the general uh, business model of search engines has been blessed, the next question is whether a single publisher can try and change the result by tinkering with factor four on its own. Uh, and that's what we'll discuss in class. Now, I want to introduce a news reporting case that offers a contrast to Hmong, the main case uh, on news reporting. Uh, this is a case called Nunez versus Caribbean International News Corporation. It's from the First Circuit in 2000, uh, nearly naked women again. The key picture here, uh, which is shown in the uh, lower left of the fairly bad reproduction of the newspaper that I have. Uh, it came from the modeling portfolio of a woman who subsequently won the Miss Puerto Rico competition in the Min Miss Universe pageant. The newspaper published uh, these racy photos as part of a public controversy over whether a woman who had allowed these explicitly sexualized pictures uh, to be taken of her should be allowed to have the title of Miss Puerto Rico the photos had been distributed freely to entities that might hire her to model for them. The first circuit held that the use of the photos in a news story about the controversy caused by the photos was fair use. Uh, the purpose and character of the use was commercial, but it was also for news reporting. If you believe the preamble's list of favored purposes should matter, there's some pro-news discrimination built into the fair use analysis. You might consider this a contrast to the nation case, and we'll also talk about whether it's meaningfully different uh, from Hmong in class. Uh, the pictures hadn't been published in the usual sense, but they had been disseminated according to their standard uses. So the right of first publication in some sense had been exercised. The court then found that the use is transformative because it changed the initial purpose of showing her modeling talents to reporting on the controversy. The picture itself is not changed, but the meaning is. In the Nunez case, the court finds good faith uh, shown by attribution to the photographer. The nature of the work, again, doesn't matter. The court says the photo isn't de designed to highlight Nunez's photography skills, but his subject's beauty. But the court doesn't actually explain why that would matter. One possibility his contributions didn't contribute to why it was newsworthy. Uh, I offer that as a possibility, but you can see why courts often say that factor two doesn't matter very much. The amount copied almost always favors the plaintiff in an image or photography case. And for that very reason, courts discount it when they've found transformativeness. Market effect. Now there is a robust market for licensing news photography. The court doesn't explain why the plaintiff in Nunez isn't entitled to participate in that, but perhaps the best answer is that the photo was created for a different market entirely. Although that doesn't in, uh, fully explain all the news reporting cases, especially we're seeing now uh, for online publishing. Um, so uh, the court doesn't do the greatest of jobs here. What is the limit of this kind of transformation case? One possible limit is if the story is just about the subject of the picture, then using a picture of the subject is not transformative, 
rather it's substitutionary for uh, the market for news uh, photography. So you hire someone to go out and get a picture of the subject. We can discuss in class whether this is a workable limit and whether the photos in Monge were the story uh, as they were in Nunez or whether they merely illustrated the story. And I'll show you another example of the potential difficulty. Suppose a tennis player posts an old picture of herself on Instagram to announce her retirement from tennis and then a newspaper embeds the Instagram post in its story about her announcement. Is the picture itself part of the story or not part of the story? In this case, the court found fair use for purposes of reporting on the story generated by the Instagram post, but courts are kind of feeling their way around with it. Uh, I'll show you some other examples of recent photo fair use cases, which are exploding, uh, and see if you can detect any pattern. So this is a, a case with the same result as in the previous case. It's fair use because it's reporting on the story. Uh, an article about uh, the backlash to an article uh, uh, about a guy who says why I won't date hot women anymore. Fair use on a motion to dismiss where the defendant used a screenshot of an article including roughly half of the, the, uh, the relevant photo and it is the top half. Uh, this case, uh, Schwarzwald versus Oath is an altered photo of John Hamm commenting on the ridiculousness of people caring about John Hamm's penis. Um, so we got a man uh, here for uh, a change. That's uh, fair use. Uh, Murano versus Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, this use of the photo was fair use for a museum exhibit given its focus on the history of the guitar rather than on the musician. So that's transformative. Uh, Harbus versus Manhattan Institute for Policy Research granted a motion to dismiss on fair use, where the use highlighted the defendant's own research and educational mission as subsequently reported on in the news story. But they aren't all wins for the defense. Uh, so this is a case finding that unauthorized use of a paparazzi photo by a clothing designer in, so in its social media to show off a model wearing the designer's clothes, with, that is not fair use. It's not transformative. It's what the paparazzi photo is for. Likewise, uh, there are similar cases uh, holding that a the news use of newsworthy photos by amateur photographers are not fair use. Um, interestingly enough, the, uh, the relevant photos are not now also uh, often freely available to the public because the court often include them in their opinions. This is my tentative attempt to characterize the pattern, though I emphasize that none of the decided cases say what I'm about to say. People in the business of making and using photos as part of their ordinary operations have to pay for photography, but people primarily in the commentary business, like think tanks, uh, don't have to pay uh, and can make transformative fair use. Uh, given what was said about market harm in Sony and then Campbell, uh, with the burden on the defendant, including on the market harm factor, the obvious thing for copyright owners to do is set about making a record. And the only limit point on this may be uh, what courts characterize as an acceptable market or not. So I think tentatively, you see that emerging in the online news photo reuse cases, where the courts are basically trying to create a normative limit on, on who's, uh, who's supposed to pay and who isn't. But I don't think uh, that it's fully settled. And in other areas, market analysis has worked differently. So uh, I wanna talk about a key development as a background to the Georgia State case in the reading. Uh, the Copyright Clearance Center uh, offers uh, blanket licenses to copy. And apparently I ditched my slide about that, but um, the CCC uh, gives you a license to copy any articles in its repertoire. You pay based on the size of your business. Uh, it got started when photocopying was the key mechanism of copying, but it now also licenses digital copying as well. How do you know whether something is in the CCC's repertoire? Maybe you can look it up, but in fact, sometimes the CCC licenses the things it doesn't actually have the right to license. At least that's what photographers say about its licenses to copy magazine articles that include photographs. One argument in favor of the CCC model is that in the absence of use-based licensing, the only way for publishers to capture some of the benefits of copying is to charge high prices, especially to libraries. And ready copying makes journals more valuable to libraries. Uh, so libraries should be willing to pay higher licensing fees to the CCC. 
Academic journals in particular have long been very expensive and the price didn't go down any since decisions supporting licensing mandates and supporting uh, requiring resort to the CCC, uh, despite the new revenue source. In fact, pr pr prices have continued to increase much faster than inflation. So in one key case, publishers sued Texaco to require Texaco to take a photocopying license from the CCC that would cover photocopying individual journal articles. Uh, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals found that individual non-coordinated copying of articles uh, of interest to individual Texaco scientists was not fair use because it was not transformative. The articles were being used for their original purpose of informing scientists. But primarily, uh, the court was influenced by factor four. Texaco's unpaid copying interfered with the right to license such copying, so Texaco needed a CCC license. If the use had been parodic or critical, the majority emphasized, CCC could not create a legitimate market just by offering a license for parody, criticism, or reviews, but it could do so uh, by creating a market license for licensing non-transformative copying. So you can't generate a market for all otherwise fair uses just by creating a working collective licensing entity. The dividing line does seem to be normative. The copyright owner just isn't entitled to certain markets, the ones that are off limits because of the proper scope of copyright. Other markets that don't exist because of factual accidents about tracking and finding copying may be subject to moving from fair use to unfair by technological improvements. The dissent strongly criticized this result for its circularities. Texaco needed a license because a license was available. But if the relevant publishers didn't participate in CCC, then its copying of articles from those publishers didn't deprive them of any revenue. Consider the effects on market structure. Is this going to make CCC into an entity that raises antitrust concerns? And uh, of course, there are echoes of that in music. Functionally, Texaco looked like it mandated a form of collective licensing. If you want to get paid, you must join a collecting society. If a copyright owner doesn't join a licensing society, then it is probably uninterested in capturing revenue from individual copying. And maybe it is also fair use for that particular work because there's a market failure for that work in that the owner inexplicably failed to participate in the market, which is the collective licensing society. That practical compromise worked for a while, but the internet changed things a lot by making individual uses more findable. So photographers in particular are interested in suing individual users without creating a collective licensing system, uh, which has uh, costs and risks of its own. So we'll consider uh, this in light of the Georgia State case in class. And then I wanna end with one other second circuit case that we may discuss further in class, uh, which is called Fox versus TV Eyes. This is the rare big data case that finds no fair use. Uh, and what happened was TVIs copied the full Fox News stream along with the other news channels, and it allowed people to search and download segments of interest to them. I wanna make a, a few points about Fox versus TVIs. First, the real problem here was that TVIs copied way too much. They copied 10 minute segments when most cl news clips were two to three minutes. This is a case that I think is best understood as turning on factor three. They took much more than reasonably necessary for their big data purpose. I think that is consistent with the Google Books uh, Court's repeated emphasis that it is only blessing snippet view as it works now. That is much less than 16% of the full work is ever available to the public. Second, if you don't agree with my take, then this case is really problematic. Fox did not in fact offer general licenses to anyone who would pay. You had to agree not to disparage Fox or its guests. So uh, no licenses for The Daily Show. Uh, Fox also routinely disappeared clips that became embarrassing because of some change in position by the Republican party and would not license those clips at all. Its licenses were therefore not a substitute for precisely the uses that fair use would protect most vigorously uh, on an individual level. And they weren't even good for aggregate searching because of the deliberate holes put in the record, which TVIs helped fix. Third, you should consider the role of market concentration in this result. Fox is a major player in TV news. The top four book publishing industry players account for nearly 20% of total industry revenue. Fox on its own has a bigger market share than that, making its claim of market harm more plausible. But one might find that disturbing because that kind of market harm analysis rewards oligopolies or monopolies by decreasing the scope of fair use of their works because it's so much easier for Fox to create a licensing market than it is even for Hachette. Um, so we will discuss these issues further in class and I'll see you then. <laughs>